Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the common criticisms that gets made against egoist perspectives in moral theory is that they can't take into account love and friendship and the values that these ought to hold for us as human beings. And Ayn Rand considers this in chapter three of her work, The Virtue of Selfishness, which is about the ethics of emergencies. There's a really nice short discussion there about the nature of love and friendship and what is going on when we, for example, make sacrifices or take others into account. And the charge that's made typically goes like this. And it's not just against, say, you know, egoists like Rand. It's also against hedonists of various sorts. The Epicureans had this thrown against them in ancient times. It's one thing to say that we don't owe anything, say, to strangers or even perhaps to our, our neighbors that we're not that close with. But what about close personal relationships? Don't we have a moral duty to show affection and respect and even love in the context of romantic relationships or spousal relationships or friendships or whatever it would happen to be. When we become close with a person, when we become intimate with them, then we cease to value them solely in so far as they please us or satisfy our desires or cater to our preferences or further our interests and we come to value them for their own sake. I mean, ideally we'd value everybody similarly, but uh, you know, for the egoist, let's go with the, the easy sell. What about this person who matters to you, your sibling, your parent, your friend, your lover? Don't they matter to you beyond just the scope of your own self-centeredness? And the worry here is that you know, friendship, love, all these things would indeed be just purely self-centered and essentially transactional where you, you know, you love somebody uh, because you find them to be a suitable erotic partner. You want to propagate your genes with them or you want to get off with them. That is enjoy sexual pleasure or you want them to hang on your arms. We call it arm candy, right? To increase your prestige or something like that. Similarly with friends, you're friends with somebody so long as they invite you to the parties. But as soon as they get cancer and are no longer fun, ep, we're done with the friendship. And this would seem to be something like, you know, uh, lower forms of friendship as described in classical ethics, you know, friendships of pleasure or utility, not friendship in terms of the person, him or herself. So this is a, a significant issue that has to be grappled with. Um, the common view that, that Rand is concerned about is that love and friendship are essentially unselfish and perhaps even disinterested. So if I love my wife, I should be ready to sacrifice at any moment my own desires, my own needs, my own wishes, my own interests, my own inclinations to make her happy or prevent her from being unhappy. So let's say, you know, let's take a silly example, right? She loves a certain kind of flower and I know that getting that will make her happy. Not only is it expensive, 
but also I happen to be allergic to that sort of flour. But I go to the flour store anyway, and I take the money that I would otherwise be using on buying myself, you know, expensive beer or cigars or something like that. Oh, I'm going to sacrifice this for, for her. Um, and, and I bring the, the things home and they're underneath my nose and I'm smelling them in and I'm like, oh, these terrible flowers. Now my eyes are watering and stuff like that. And I get there and I get down on my knee. Here you go, honey. And she's like, oh, uh, lovely. I'm so happy that you bought me the, we'll call them allergy flowers, right? Um, that's the way that, that some people do, in fact, think about love. You know, the more that you, you give, the more that you love, right? So sacrificing yourself and your own interests, your own desires, shows the love or care or affection or friendship. And I'll mention another thing that she's not talking about here, but it does come up in other contexts. And that is um, grief when the person is, you know, absent, uh, let's say through death and you'll never be able to see them again. Um, do you, you know, should you tear your hair out and cry till your eyes are red and can't cry anymore and stop eating? People did this in the middle ages. Sometimes people actually did die of grief or the, the results of it, you know, because they, they indulge themselves in these pretty wild expressions of it. Um, some people think that if you don't do that sort of thing, it means you didn't care about the person and they take that as an index. Again, self-sacrificing behavior becomes the proxy for whether you actually feel love or affection or friendship. Rand says, no, that's a misguided way of looking at things. She says, love and friendship are profoundly personal, selfish values. And she goes on and says, love is an expression and assertion of self-esteem. We're going to get to that in a moment. Um, these are personal values. We feel love, affection, friendship towards other persons as the person who we are. And even if we took the, you know, the viewpoint of, of love where uh, it's supposed to be totally self-sacrificing, if I had a terrible wife who wanted me to sacrifice, for my, uh, sacrifice my own interests for her all the time, she would want them to be my interests, right? Not the interests of somebody else, but my own. It would be personal. But Rand is saying, no, no, love in a good sense is profoundly personal and it's selfish. Friendship is selfish. How does this work? How can this make sense? So she says, um, love is an expression and assertion of self-esteem. Self-esteem, it's important to keep in mind for Rand, is a uh, value and it leads to the virtue of pride. Um, it's, it's a capacity to value oneself properly. So an expression or assertion of one's own self-esteem, one's own self-valuing. And you see those same values in another. A response, she says, to one's own values in the person of another. So this implies that in order for you to feel love or friendship to another person, you have to see at least the potential of the same values, the same shared, as she's calling it, hierarchy of values, the way in which we order and prioritize things in our lives in the other person. And without this, I mean, we could have a, a, an attractiveness to the other person. We could think that they're different than they are. We could enjoy things that we do with them, whether it be, you know, eating popcorn and watching movies or talking about things in fandom or nerddom or jumping into bed and having athletic sex or, you know, listening to records together, whatever it happens to be, right? Um, but unless we actually share in values, unless when we are in the process of self-discovery and discovery of who the other person is, unless there's that commonality there, we're not really going to be in love. Love in the genuine sense involves that. She also thinks that friendship involves that as well. Um, she thinks that, uh, here we go. Um, 
We, we express and uphold and translate our values into practical reality. We see how a person lives and then we come to see that they have the same values of us as, as we do. She also talks about taking personal selfish joy from the existence of the other person. And this is different than just getting something out of them. This is, again, recognizing a valuableness to the other person and seeing that they matter. So she, she gives some interesting examples here. She says, concern for the welfare of those one loves is a rational part of one's own selfish interests. If a man who is passionately in love with his wife spends a fortune to cure her of a dangerous illness, it would be absurd to claim that he does it as a sacrifice for her sake, not his own, and that it makes no difference to him personally and selfishly whether she lives or dies. It, he does value her existing, which of course she values as well, but he values her existing for him. Now this raises, of course, the question, well, what about... If you were to be called upon to do some, some action that is going to impinge on your own interests um, and it's going to be for the person who you love and you're never going to see that person again, they're going to be off in another country and you're not going to be able to go there. Um, should you do that? And Rand would say, yeah, I mean, that's we're in the ethics of emergencies. The more you value the person, the more you will, in fact, be willing to risk, not because you have a duty to do so, but because that's an expression of what she calls uh, integrity. Um, so she, she goes a little bit later on. She says, the virtue involved in helping those one loves is not selflessness or sacrifice, but integrity. Integrity is loyalty to one's convictions and values. It's the policy of acting in accordance with one's values, translating them into practical reality. And she has a great example here. If a, if a man professes to love a woman, yet his actions are indifferent, inimical, or damaging to her, there's a lack of integrity, she says. And she, she goes on, she says, this lack of integrity makes him immor uh, immoral. And why would she say that? Because integrity is itself a virtue. Um, which Rand thinks is incredibly important. She also talks about a man who uh, is able to swim and save his drowning wife, but then becomes panicky, gives into an unjustified fear and lets her drown, spends his life in loneliness and misery, misery. She says, we would condemn him morally for his treason to himself and to his own values. His failure to fight for the preservation of a value crucial to his own happiness, namely, the, va the value of his wife's life that he could have saved. So there is a personal selfish joy from the existence of the other and not merely their bare existence, but their existence as a human being, as an agent, as a creator, as a thinker, a reasoner, as somebody else who does these things. She also talks about incorporating the welfare of the other person into one's own hierarchy of values. And she uses that phrase hierarchy of values several times in this essay. That is not something unique to Rand. Um, there were quite a few philosophers in the early 20th century who talked in terms of a hierarchy of values. Um, Mark Shaler would be a, a prime example of this. A lot of people will always want to bring up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, not quite the same thing as the hierarchy of values. This is the values that we accord to things and what we're willing to sacrifice for others. So she says, sacrifice is the surrender of a greater value for the sake of a lesser one or of a non-value, which is, you know, actually different than what Shaler says about this, but we go on. So she, she says that the rational principle of conduct is always act in accordance with the hierarchy of your values, never sacrifice a greater value to a lesser one. So, you know, what might be the things that we value? 
this tie, it, I've had it for a long time. It's pleasing to me in its color and I like the way that it, it fits. So there's an aesthetic value that it has. It also has a certain use value. I know that if I need to go into a uh, formal situation, I can wear this tie and it's going to be durable and it's not going to let me down, right? The stuff in the back hasn't come apart, even though this, this tie is been in a lot of places. It's, it's gone, you know, from one place to another, to another. I've had this probably for 15 to 20 years. Um, but if called upon to sacrifice this tie for the opportunity to, I don't know, study with Julia Anas, great, uh, virtue ethicist, uh, probably once in a lifetime opportunity, I should like throw the tie off immediately and say, I'm going for that. If, you know, somebody is like, well, you pick one or the other. And I'm like, well, I don't know. It really is a nice tie. There's something wrong with me then. And we can say the same thing about our relationships with persons in terms of love and friendship. Rand is perfectly fine with saying that we should in fact sacrifice it, not in the sense of betraying a higher value for a lower value, but in the ordinary sense of, you know, saying, well, I'm going to give this thing up. We should be willing to give a lot of things up for the sake of love and friendship. If we really value that person and if that person really does deserve it, provided we're not deceiving ourselves and thinking that just because we enjoy sleeping with somebody that they're there by a good person. How many of us have made that mistake in the past, right? Um, there are so many people who lack integrity and justice in, in, in those senses that we wind up being involved in. Now, she also um, uh, discusses in other places this figure of the traitor. And I think that can be useful in thinking about love and friendship because love and friendship, as so many philosophers have pointed out, there are some transactional elements to it where you give something in order to get something back, or you give with the expectation that it may not, you know, directly result from that, but they'd also better show some reciprocity to you. So if you are a attentive, generous, uh, you know, uh, uh, amiable lover, well, then you, you've got a right to expect that from the other person. If they don't give it to you, then maybe you break off the relationship, right? Because they're not showing themselves as the kind of person who has the same values as you. A friend who doesn't answer your texts and calls, there is a problem there, a lack of attentiveness, right? Uh, the person who's always flaking out on you, you don't have to be friends with them necessarily, right? So there, there is a kind of reciprocity or transactionality that's involved in what Rand would call genuine love or friendship, which she takes as being something quite different than the ordinary view of things. So this is Rand's view on what friendship and love really are about. It has to do with, with valuing. And, um, you know, it's a different view than the common view, but it does manage to address a lot of the worries and criticisms that people have about egoism, uh, making the other person merely instrumental and not valuing them uh, in, in their own right as a person. There's, there's something more to Rand than just saying, well, everybody's just there for my own satisfaction, the way a crude egoism might frame it.